is John Timpane. And he's Don Rooney. And this is The Musical Intertube. Now you may ask, why is this podcast called The Musical Intertube? And we may reply, because that's its name, of course. Now, how did this podcast get that name? Back in college, we hosted a radio show. Once, we tried to introduce a soothing musical interlude. But instead, we messed up and wound up introducing a soothing musical intertube. And the name stuck. So here we are, hundreds of years later, still talking. Talking to interesting people about their interesting lives. Difference makers who really make a difference. Today, we welcome back to the musical intertube, Catherine Ramsland, a professor of criminal justice and forensic psychology at DeSales University. She's an expert on crime scene investigation, serial killers and mass murders, vampires, sex offenders, and ghosts. And she's also a very accomplished author. She's here to discuss her brand new Nutcracker Gang mystery thriller titled In the Damaged Path. Welcome, Catherine Ramsland again. Thanks for having me. It's fun to be here with you guys. Absolutely. And we love being here with you because uh, it it allows us to learn something that we didn't know before. And uh, there's a lot of that, don't you think, Don? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, we're yes. total idiots. Anytime we can have somebody smart on the program, we're yeah. really, really grateful. Yeah. So I'm going to read a passage from uh, your novel, Catherine, okay. in which I think the the image of the damaged path steps forward. It, it steps forward in several ways in the book. And I hope you comment on it after I'm done. The tornado veered to the left and seemed to consider revisiting us. I tensed as I sensed it looking at me, but then it swung away as if a sudden blast of sirens had deterred it. A couple near us hugged each other and exclaimed over what they'd seen. The sky cleared, yielding enough of the fading light to see glimpses of the destruction below. Downed trees, piles of debris, broken fences and flung vehicles. In one place, the skeletal frame of a big rig blocked the road. My eardrums ached. More sirens cut through the air, along with flashing red lights. As Mora had said, if Bruder were truly suicidal, he could exploit the chaos to complete his plan. But chaos could serve him in other ways, too. I felt his eyes on me. He wanted something. I drew my arms together, aware he could carve out a more malignant damage path than this tornado had just done. Woo. I like it. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> it's wonderful. So, Catherine, the metaphor of the damage path, uh, talk a little bit more about that. This all started with my research in weather. And I had done weather, a hurricane for the previous novel. And I love tornadoes. I don't know why. I grew up in Michigan, I guess. So, we, and that, that sense of, of um, tension in the air I thought was really perfect for this. And then I saw that phrase, damage path, as a way for tornado scientists to understand the behavior of a tornado. So they studied all the destruction. It came, how long the tornado went, how wide it was, how much force, what kind of damage it caused. Um, and I realized that's so much like profiling a serial killer that you don't know. You ha You learn the behavior, you put Everything you you find out into a database to compare it with others, the same way they do with tornadoes. And so when my characters start to talk about tornadoes, and one of them is a forensic meteorologist, she mentions damage path. And right away, they see the metaphor. That's that's exactly what we're doing. We're following the damage path of a serial killer to try to figure out where he buried his victims. And we were going in blind in a way that you do with, with a tornado. Um, but you do have a data, database to use. You do have ways to analyze the behavior you see, thanks to people who came before you to study the damage path of either the human or the tornado. So I thought the metaphor was amazing. It, it's, it's so perfect. And, and in this particular moment, there's others seated throughout the novel but annie is realizing that uh yes uh she just narrowly had narr i should say that annie is the protagonist if there is one in the novel uh she's sort of the head of a team of of investigators uh trying to catch uh, certain miscreants and trying not to give too much up but she suddenly realizes as you once did that uh, there's another person who's carving 
his own damage path and uh he could make one even worse than the uh the tornado i thought that was beautiful yeah and also one of the uh, one of the observations made was sometimes after a tornado there's a there's a back draft more, that can be more damaging and sometimes there are spin-off tornadoes and that's like a serial killer with accomplices or a serial killer who doubles back and does something else so there was so much about the behavior of a tornado that I thought was really appropriate to this. And as a uh, former TV weatherman, I do have to kind of put an aside in here. Uh, when a tornado would come through the area where I live in central Pennsylvania, um, the people of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, would have to come through to officially confirm that it was a tornado, try to figure out the, the severity of it. Uh, and sometimes they would come through and say, well, no, this isn't a tornado. It's just straight wind damage because mm -hmm. that happens occasionally too. And people would be so disappointed. Yeah. Oh, a tornado didn't come through. This was just regular wind. <laughs> well, said, that just happened to us. We thought we had three tornadoes last week and it was two straight wind in events with, it, with a tornado. But yeah, they wanted it to be three tornadoes. Yeah. Well, because a straight wind um, can kick up a lot of, of power over yeah. a wider range. A tornado is limited to, to the base and how yeah. wide it is. It could be a mile across, um, but to, uh, straight winds can, can hit a, a much wider area and do a lot more damage. But I just thought that was interesting that people are just so in love with the idea of tornadoes that if a tornado didn't come through, they were kind of disappointed. Well, but in a way, it, it's like the podcasters in the novel who are playing off the serial killer craze and sometimes making stuff up to find, to link victims so that the, the bad guy is even worse than you, yeah. that we thought. And that's very much so what we do see sometimes with podcasters is they're linking cases that may have no links whatsoever. But, but that same disappointment happens when it's not a serial killer. Yeah. And John and I are, aren't smart enough to link anything to anybody, so, yeah. so we're safe on that. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to ask you about is John has introduced you as a uh, forensic psychologist. We know from, from TV and other sources that there are forensic scientists. And you just mentioned that there's a forensic meteorologist. There are, there are so many different uh, branches under the forensic title. Um, what is a forensic meteorologist and how do they work into... Uh, going into a, a, a scene of, of carnage and death. Any kind of uh, work done under the auspices of forensic means that they're doing it for the courts and the investigation system. Not all of them are scientists, though unfortunately, thanks to TV, there's this, this kind of idea that anytime you use forensics, it's science, and it's not. It's really about the court system, and sometimes it's just a, a technician Who's, who's forensic or, but they're applying whatever it is they do to the court system or within the court system or investigative system. So if you're doing meteorology as a, as a weather scientist, but it's specific to criminal cases, now that, now you add the forensic title in there. So you probably have more training, um, in, the courtroom and in the investigation process so that you can do a more knowledgeable kind of analysis of a scene. Like you might have, um, you know, an incident where it looks like somebody was accidentally killed during a weather event. And so the forensic meteorologist will now, who knows about weather patterns and all of that, also knows about the forensics angle. And they might spot things that an ordinary meteorologist or even an ordinary investigator wouldn't spot because they, they bring in two disciplines. It's kind of like forensic nursing. The nurses are trained on evidence analysis and collection in a way that ordinary nurses are not. Obviously, Annie Hunter, she runs a PI agency. Um, and she brings other people into the investigation. That's part of the trick. It's not just a one person thing, although she obviously is the center of much of the action. Uh, I'm wondering, can you describe the different talents of her team? What, what are some of the people she brings in? Because one of the wonders of your writing in these two Nutcracker novels so far is 
the team inv- of investigators that Annie manages to assemble. They're, they're a bunch of interesting types and they have great talents. I'd love to hear a little bit more about them. Okay. So the idea for me was to first have a primary team. And this primary team would always show up. They're always going to be part of these cases. That would be Annie, who is a forensic psychologist and then has the investigation angle. Her PI, a private investigator, is uh, Aidan Scott, who has many, many other talents as well. So he, he works on investigations, but then he can also do construction and, <laughs> and <laughs> search and rescue and all these other things. Um, and then she has a data manager and assistant and confidant who is also a cadaver dog handler named Natra. Natra is based on a real person that I've worked with on, on death investigation teams. So that's my primary team. And then I bring in a digital examiner, uh, a cyber expert guy for whenever they need him. He, I would say he would be the fourth member if there were another primary member. Jax uh, is an attorney. So he shows up in, in two novels, but he might not show up in maybe the third novel or fourth novel. So he's not a primary member. He's an, he's an attorney and specifically a juvenile attorney because that was the cases they were working on. Then the forensic meteorologist will probably show up again, but she's not in the first novel. So, so she's not part of the primary team. Um, Annie has a network of these kinds of experts that she can call on depending on what she needs. And that was similar to an exhumation team that I used to, that I actually wrote a book for with and if he needed a radiologist or a geologist or or a pathologist or anthropologist or you know whatever, but he didn't always need all of them, so they'd come in and out as needed, and that's what gave me the idea of having this network of experts um, who would be characters, but they wouldn't always show up the way the three primary, the core team would. And is this the way it works? I mean, in the real world. It is the way it works. Um, you will have people who, who are used to working together. And if, if they have a need, they'll call on that person. And then that person maybe knows somebody it won't bring, you know, bring it in. I know our exclamation team, I guess would, I'd say we had a core of maybe six who always showed up. But it, in the wider arena, it, probably about 20 people who we could bring in and out. Because supposedly, if you have a, a person who's recently been buried, well, you need a pathologist. But if you only have bones, you don't need a pathologist, you need an anthropologist, specifically a forensic anthropologist, because they would understand things like like wound trajectories, you know, th- th- saw marks on bone, she said that. So, but you don't need to bring your pathologist in on that. But you definitely need the central people, the manager the person who keeps all the records, uh, the criminalist who knows how to handle evidence. So th- I think that team gave me the idea and I like the flexibility because, you know, you don't want it to jumble your novel with so many characters that people are just like, okay, we had that person before. And I don't want to just mention them just because they've worked on Annie's team. I want only those three. And even sometimes her daughter comes in and out. She's in the first one. She's not in the second one. She'll call me in on the third one. And she sometimes contributes. How many of these do you have mapped out already, Catherine? <laughs> I have, uh, I'm working on the third one. The fourth one is in my mind at this mm, point. Okay. And I have some short stories also going on with, with that same team. It started with a short story. Actually, it was for a a, pol- a writer's police academy anthology it was to benefit police. And that's where the the first kernel of this team was born, was in a short story. Now, um, a lot of, uh, again, popular media that we've been exposed to, when you get a private eye type of person like Annie is, as your protagonist, there is a huge uh, f- uh, propensity to make the police really dumb. And the police are not dumb in yours. And and I would venture to say that having worked on a couple of these teams, police aren't really dumb. That they know what they're doing and they go about their business in a very methodical way to make sure that, again, thinking ahead, 
whatever th- they find in this case will hold up in court. Right. Is that another goal of yours in these books is to is to portray how things actually happen with a little bit of, you know, dash thrown in, a little bit of suspense like, well, you know, sitting I mean, out a tornado. Yeah, I'm a good question. Uh, Annie's ex-husband is is a detective and so that supplies the conflict because she needs him, he needs her. They have a he has a grudging respect for her, but on the other hand, he doesn't want her interfering with his investigation. And so certainly the when I've worked and I, I do some death investigation consulting. So uh, I typically will work with cops who who do want to understand or do want to to work with the the data that we have. Um, I I'm not going to say you're not going to find some cops who really you know aren't up on things. You, you definitely have them, but um, those who are going to be working with consulting teams or who would even respect PIs because a lot of them don't. Uh, they they'll be more open and probably more educated in that in this kind of um, treatment. But you know, you oh in in fiction, you always have to keep that conflict going. So yeah. you don't want to build a team where oh everybody really loves working with each other. <laughs> you want to build teams that that there's they have to work together in some ways, but really don't want to. And that's certainly the case with. Annie and her husband, but even though it wraps up uh, for them in a in a good way, throughout there's this, I've got my job, you've got yours, stay in your own territory kind of thing. But I do I do like to show how it seems to me a place will work with us. Don points out something that you do see in ninety percent of um, of crime shows on television, which is the uh, you know the dumb chief of police who insists on it's got to be this way. And we always turn to each other when we're sitting on the couch watching this and going, he's wrong. <laughs> we don't know it yet, but he's the guy who's wrong and is going to force everything to be that much worse, that much harder. Yeah. And that, and I kind of have that with, with Annie's ex, um, Wayne is he's, he's sort of a long suffering. Oh my God, you've been on this forever. Nothing's going to happen. But on the other hand, he's curious oh, you have a new forensic technique going on. I'd like to see what happens. So to his credit, he arrives at the right time to take over, um, but certainly dragging his feet because, you know, it's his (laughs) (laughs) ex-wife. Yes, yes. He's really sort of reluctant to give her any credit, even though he feels admiration for her at the same time. It's really interesting to watch that play out. We'll return to our show in just a moment, but first... Here's a soothing musical interlude. Catherine has written more than 60 books and 1,000 articles, has participated in many crime investigations, and is a blogger at Psychology Today and a frequent guest in the television and podcast world. Among her nonfiction books are Confession of a Serial Killer, The Criminal Mind, The Science of Vampires, True Stories of CSI, and Snap, Seizing Your Aha Moment. Her fiction books include Blood Hunters, The Heat Seekers, and most recently, In the Damaged Pass, a Nutcracker investigation out on August 22nd and available at all good book venues. For more on this truly Renaissance personality, check out her Facebook page at facebook.com slash kath.ramsland. That's K-A-T-H dot R-A-M-S-L-A-N-D. Or follow her on X, formerly Twitter, at Kat Ramsland. And now we return you to the musical inner tube already in progress. We learned uh, from you uh, that this is based on a real crime. Can you talk about how you found out about that crime and what, because I'm, I'm trying not to give the story away. I want everybody to read uh, this lovely novel in The Damaged Path. And, uh, and yet I really want to find out about 
what this crime was. I mean, it's it's hair raising. And, uh, you know, talk about how you discovered that. Well, I like to weave more than one crime together. So in this novel, you have Annie's kind of doing her official work, what she gets paid to do. And she's going to a trial that's based on the coerced suicide case of uh, Michelle Carter when, when she basically talked her supposed boyfriend into um, committing suicide. So that's going on. But I, but I then take that and go, something else is happening here than what we see. And that, that spins the plot. Against the background of that, we have a different case forming that it's going to kind of take her by surprise. And that's based on uh, this really wacky case from 1983 in New Jersey of um, a woman who had sort of gathered some kids around herself and kind of brainwashed them into believing a very bizarre scenario um, to the point where a murder was committed. So I'm not going to say much about that, but a murder was committed. And um, from I... I Use that as the base and then think about what could those kids have become as a result of that experience. So that, that's not the, that's not real life. That's my rendition based on a real case. So the two, the two cases end up converging in a way you don't foresee. Uh, but I like to do that. I like to bring in twisty, weird cases that are really, that are real, um, and then do something with them that, you know, shows who my characters are, but also, and I honestly, I never know how it's going to end. I really did not know certain characters, like Pete the Panty Thief was never supposed to be anything other than the handoff artist, and <laughs> turned out he, he, he had more things to do than I expected. <laughs> I love that about writing fiction is, is you if you create your character with enough complexity, they can suddenly go, yeah, I'm not going to bed yet. <laughs> we got we got other things to do with this book. And it's it's I love the surprise factor. But I will tell you, honestly, all the way to the end, I didn't know it was gonna happen. Wow. <laughs> that, I mean, you know, I mean some some writers do and some writers don't. I think it would be more fun for the writer to write without knowing, you know. Yeah. What's what's gonna? Uh, were you led to the ending that you fashioned, or did you have to impose it, or did you feel it was sufficiently inevitable? Can you tell tell us about that? Because obviously, you've just described one point in the writing, which is where oh, I don't know, <laughs> and then you so, get to, you know, yeah, I have this book called Snap: Seizing Your Aha Moments that I wrote is that is about the process of generating aha moments on a regular basis if you set it up right and i use science i use and my own experience and so my experience is if i get stuff in place that seems to be working and i go for a walk my brain is going to hash it out and deliver or during the night it's going to deliver somehow it's going to deliver to me insights and you know 71 books later <laughs> seems to be working <laughs> <laughs> because it keeps happening. And I've learned to trust that as things are coming to me, my brain's, you know, mixing them all up and delivering, maybe not all at once, but delivering over and over. And I will tell you, sometimes I'm frustrated because I feel like I painted myself into a corner or I don't know how to get out. Um, and then bang, <laughs> there it is. And that's the aha moment. I love it. And I think if I, I do know you can train yourself to have those on a regular basis. To sort of leave yourself open for it. Yeah. Yeah. But know your process. Like for some reason, I, I think it was, um, I think it was Ray, not Ray, Isaac Asimov. When he gets stuck, he go to a movie and bang, 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 here mm -hmm. it comes. Yeah. Um, some people do it in the shower. Some people, you know, he count on their dream process. Some do it walking the dog or playing frisbee or whatever, you find out the one that works for you and then you make it work for you. Yeah. Stephen King said he took walks and then he took that one walk where the truck hit him. And yeah, right. <laughs> well, that was probably not a good idea, but yeah, that was that was his process was to to think yeah. it over in his mind while he was taking a walk. And you don't and you don't even think it over. You 
just let it go because yeah. your brain is taking what what uh, in the book I talk a lot about. It, it, you're making a salad. You're 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 grabbing all these things like my study on tornadoes and that my study of these cases and my study of different for- areas of forensics. And now I just put it all in there. Let the brain, you know, reassociate everything and deliver. And, you know, maybe my reviewers are going to say, yeah, that's not a good idea. (laughs) (laughs) I enjoy how it works. Um, Kathy, uh, this brings up uh, another issue uh, in in many in many crime stories uh, and in your novels, too, is that solving a crime involves several different kinds of thinking, doesn't it? It's, it involves the kind of thinking where, oh, look, this house was blown apart. There must have been a tornado. And that's that's fairly direct reasoning from um, effects to cause. But then there are other kinds. There's intuition. There's even, in many crime stories, uh, a hint of, of um, other worlds or, or a hint of of uh you know the occult i know there's a dab of that in here with the indigenous uh arts thing that one of the characters brings in to the story which i love i think that's delectable can you talk about that notion of you know just different ways of thinking uh because you've just described you know uh, a writing process which is rational on the one hand and on the other hand you sort of let it go to see what it makes and uh obviously it's got a lot in common with solving crimes yeah, well, one of one of um, Annie's renowned behaviors is always thinking about what didn't happen that should have. That's a much harder process than yeah. Because so so you might look at the house and say a tornado hit it, or hmm, is there something missing here that would tell us this really isn't about a tornado; it's about something else. So she's always watching for that the lack of behavior, um, you know, the dog in the night idea. The dog didn't bark. So what was missing? That's it's a really important process that a lot of people miss because they're thinking along the most obvious pathways. Another thing I bring into it um, is remote viewing, which our government used for two decades. <laughs> so it works. I've seen people trained in it who weren't psychic. Um, it's not necessarily a, a make, making my world paranormal. It's recognizing that there are more ways of processing information and gaining information than the, the the typical cognitive style that we we come to think about as thinking there's more to it and so Annie's open to that she should use whatever works and I'll tell you I've worked with a couple some FBI agents who said the same thing uh, if, if a if a psychic works I use a psychic I mean I tell a story in this book about the Kimberly Leach case, which is the last victim of Ted Bundy. They found her with remote viewing. And that prosecutor, whom I've spoken to, wrote about that in his book. And he said, I don't care what anyone's going to say. This is what happened. Uh, some, it, the, the woman who gave us this remotely viewed map of the, of the out, the way the terrain laid out was completely wrong by hundreds of miles of where it was located, but she was dead on with what it looked like to the point where we searched that area much more thoroughly than we would have and found the body. Yeah, we had a great discussion last time, Catherine, about remote viewing, but for our listeners, uh, can you define what remote viewing is? Yeah, it's pretty simple. Remote viewing is simply the the, uh, real-time... Ability to envision something occurring or or a structure at a, a place distant from you or that you can't see. It could be ar- across around the world. It could be you know on the next block over. You don't see it, but you can draw it. You can or put it into words. You can somehow process it, um, usually in a trance state, and put it on paper. You have. Typically, to test it, you would have an outbounder who goes and finds the structure or the garden or what you know, whatever it is they are going to look at, and the remote viewer will draw what they think. You know, they'll, they'll envision stuff, they'll draw it, and then you match that to what the outbounder actually saw, and that's how you test it. And I've I've watched people get trained in that who were not psychic, 
Uh, so I don't know exactly what it is, but I would not call it paranormal in the sense of ghosts and vampires kind of thing. It's not supernatural. It's extra natural or you know, something. It's an ability that people can train themselves to do well. And more artistic people like Aiden, Scott, my PI guy, might be able to see it better because he's very visual and he's already used to drawing. So that's what it means. And, and they used it for spying and they used it to find fugitives and they used it to find dr drug trade. And they, so, so they used it for about two and a half decades. This is the government, right? The government, yes, yeah. the government. And it was very useful as it turns out. Yes, Historically it was. <laughs> uh, quite useful so that it's, uh, it's just universally accepted uh, in a field of study that Many people would be shocked to know would accept such a thing, except it's really useful and it really works. It's really so, useful. So and it's got to be a thing. Yeah, it, it was astonishing. All the stories that Annie tells about it are real stories. Everything. She, that, none of that's made up. It's all, all based on research. <laughs> let me, let me um, talk about a wider problem that, that both of your books uh, bring out. Both of your books have troubled kids uh, at the core who are doing some really, really violent and nasty things. And part of that seems to come from the problems that we have in our uh, uh, taking care of orphans, uh, you know, in, in our uh, juvenile justice system. These kids are put through those systems. They come out on the other end in a wrong fashion and do some terribly wrong things or are uh, mentally scarred by it. Um, it, it. It, from what you've... Uh, said in your books and what you've experienced in real life, this is a real problem and we're not getting any better at it, right? We're not getting better. There certainly is corruption in some of the juvenile justice systems. I mean, I used the kids for cash case. That was real in Pennsylvania mm -hmm. where judges were sending kids to detention just so they could get kickbacks, uh, monetary kickbacks. Um, I also, myself, when I started my own, before I even went to college, I was a, and I lived in a group home uh, with kids coming out of the system. I was a counselor, just like one year older than that, and learning their stories. But also, I just spent the last year and a half talking to an accomplice to a serial killer who was only 15 when he was made to murder another boy. And by the time he was 17, he killed nine. And his, but his life aspirations were to be a minister. So how did this predator turn him? And so I think you see, you know, I learned a lot from him about that process. And it's unfortunate we don't put a lot of, of money into kids, but that's really where a lot of the, the, the seeds of the, the violence start. If you can do something with early intervention, we're going to be a lot better off as a society. I think we may have mentioned this last time also that we see the process, the social process of passing along abuse from generation to generation, don't we? And uh, the children who are abused early in their lives and therefore made into people who can't really live into society really reflect the abuse of those who had them either an institution or parents or neighbors or whoever it was, uh, older kids. And you see that cycle of passing along abuse uh, that ends, well, it maybe it doesn't end. Maybe it just continually exerts itself in crimes. It does. And I think there are, the more we learn and getting back to the damage path, the more we learn from the damage done, the more we can think about how do we prevent this? Because we have more knowledge and we have, we have better tools. It's exactly what we're trying to do with tornadoes. How can we alert people earlier so that there's less disruption or less loss of life? It's a very similar process. And Annie uh, Hunter, uh, your protagonist, uh, she's very sympathetic to the plight of children. She's also cagey about things like the paranormal. She'll use whatever works, right? Uh, right. Reminded me of you, Catherine, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Which she's based on me. And in uh, fact, uh, uh. I'll tell you what, how that happened. I was pitching something to a, a Showtime group of producers, and one of them said, 
why aren't you writing books about what you do? <laughs> and I thought, I do do some interesting things. I do exactly the stuff that Annie Hunter does. And uh, why not? So all of her attitude. So she's younger and prettier, but that's okay. <laughs> so yes, Annie Hunter it, it replicates a lot of my life and my attitudes about things, but especially about the paranormal. I'm open. I want it's this stuff to work, but I am very skeptical, and so is she. And she has certainly been able to go in and peel back the layers of some of the claims made by psychics and mediums and whatnot. But nevertheless, I want to believe, you know, there's that attitude. I, I, I would love it if something really turned out to be genuine. That's certainly me all through and through it. The novel is In the Damaged Path. It's the second novel in the Nutcrackers Investigations series by our guest, Catherine Ramsland, who is the pattern for Annie Hunter, the main investigator, and very good read. Wonderful talking with you, Catherine. I hope you come back when uh, book number three, even before that, I love when to. book number three comes out. All right. Thank you for coming to the Musical Inner Tube once again. Well, thank you. I'm, I was, it was a lot of fun to be here. Great questions. Hey, Jenny. Uh, I mean, Catherine. <laughs> yes. And thank you for listening to The Musical Inner Tube. Our lovely little podcast is available everywhere good podcasts are found. Listen on your favorite platform, and if you like what you hear, please give us a good rating. And spread the word. Tell your friends about The Inner Tube, and let them know they can subscribe to the podcast on our website, musicalinnertube.com. There you can listen to all of our podcasts, see pictures and biographies of our guests, and contact us. You can even click on the microphone button in the lower right corner to leave us a voicemail. And don't forget to leave your email address on our Talk to the Tube page so we can stay in touch. And you can email us directly at musicalinnertube at gmail.com. And as always, thanks to virtual band Car Radio Dog for our theme music. Music.